Thank you, Stephen. Uh, my name is Shannon and I'm a grateful recovered alcoholic and I I'm from Maryville, Tennessee. And, um, you know, those who are expecting Polly tonight, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but I'm so grateful to be here. I'm honored to be here. I'm nervous as can be. Those are huge shoes to fill. And I'm proud to say she is my sponsor. And I'm telling you what, she's as humble as they come. She's as real as they come. I get to talk to her all the time. And uh, she, she always picks up the phone. She doesn't just uh, speak behind the podium. She lives this deal. And she's a living, breathing miracle. And she shared with me so much. And I'm so grateful. Um, and she would be the first to tell me, stop talking about me and start giving an adequate representation of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what I, my prayer and hope is tonight, uh, to, to do just that. And um, I've got to say that I couldn't be more grateful. If you would have told me that Alcoholics Anonymous would be the most important thing in my life uh, 14 years ago, I wouldn't have believed you. Um, it's uh, through the grace of God, these 12 steps, strong sponsorship, um, and a, a spiritual awakening that has happened as a result of working these steps that I haven't found it necessary to take a drink since October 13th of 2008. And it's a miracle for my life. Um, and not, and it hasn't just been not drinking. It's been, you know, I used to hear people say, Polly included, a life beyond my wildest dreams. And I thought, what are they trying to sell me here? You know, I couldn't, I could barely make it to a meeting. I couldn't muster up a gratitude list. I could barely pray. You know, I was just doing the deal because those were the directions I was given because I had nowhere else to go and I had no other options. Um, but I found that that's exactly where I needed to be. And I found that once I saw that God was all I had, and that AA was all I had, I found I had everything I needed. Um, I've been given a way of life that really works in really, really rough times and in really, really awesome times. I'm an alcoholic, whether I'm happy, sad, and everything in between. Because I have an allergy to alcohol, and uh, what that means for me is I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol once I put it in my body in any shape form or fashion means I can't stop once I start but my mind will tell me that I'm choosing to continue to drink and that's the baffling part of it is my mind I literally think I'm choosing to pick up that first drink when the truth is I'm utterly powerless over alcohol and how did I find that out I found that out um my very first drink my first drunk that I would say probably counted um that counted as a drunk was when I was 14 years old I was with a friend we got drunk at, at my house we were having a sleepover and it was the best feeling I'd ever had all the years of growing up as an insecure little girl with a uh, four father figures by the time I was 14 because my mom got married 10 times to eight different people married a couple of them twice um a very tumultuous childhood a lot of drama a lot of chaos um uh to go with that you know, and a lot of people would say, oh, well, that's what made you an alcoholic. That's not what made me an alcoholic. Um, it made me maybe neurotic a little bit um, and, and scared and insecure or whatever, but it isn't what actually made me an alcoholic. And so that first good drunk I had at age 14, what happened was I remember pouring you know, a bunch of alcohol into a glass and my friend and I sharing it. And I remember instinctively, and I heard another speaker who was a dear, dear friend of mine. She, the way she put words to this, you know, that's one of the awesome things about Alcoholics Anonymous and our fellowship and how we share the language of the heart is you guys are able to put words to what I'm feeling and thinking and how I behave and, and what's going on with me, because I don't know, I didn't know what alcoholism was when I first got here, but the way she described it is she instinctively knew that she needed to drink this alcohol, this glass of booze as hard and fast as she knew how. She just knew she was supposed to, and that's exactly what I did. I could do, and I did that, and I got drunk. It was the best thing in the world. I remember all of a sudden I wasn't scared. I wasn't, my mind was shut off. I could breathe. Alcohol gave me what a phone booth gives to Superman. 
or to Clark Kent, you know, um, walk in normal, painfully normal, not normal, painfully mediocre, because I either have to be the best or the worst. Average, can't stand to be average, I've left to my own devices. And then what alcohol does for me is it gives me a sense of ease and comfort that I can't describe. And I have been unable to create that ease and comfort um, with alcohol since, since, since that first drunk. But what's interesting is all through high school, I didn't do it again. I was too scared of getting into trouble because um, my mom was pretty strict. And I knew that if I got into trouble in high school, I would be grounded. And I didn't want to do that because that meant I had to stay home with all the drama. Um, and her, her deal with me was as long as you keep your nose clean, as long as you stay out of trouble, you can have all the freedom you want. And I took her up on that and she wasn't lying. I was an honor student. By the time I graduated high school, I was being offered basketball scholarships. I was an honor, like I said, an honor student. I was homecoming queen. I was voted every senior superlative and president of the Latin club, you name it. I was the, I was the girl people wanted to be by the time I graduated, I had all kinds of hopes and dreams and um, declined the basketball scholarship because I wanted to go to UT and get out of Kingston. I grew up in Kingston, Tennessee, which is about 30 miles west of Knoxville on I-40. Um, it was a great little place to grow up. And um, anyway, I moved off to UT and all of a sudden I was a small uh, fish in a very large ocean and those feelings of inadequacy came back and I'm hanging around with friends that were in sorority girls who had money that I did not have and uh, connections that I did not have, but yet they welcomed me and I wanted to be a part of and alcohol did that for me. Again, I was given the opportunity to drink, I poured a glass, half, a big old glass of uh, liquor mixed it with some Gatorade and instinctively knew I was supposed to drink it as hard as fast as I knew how to do it and I did it and my mind shut off I could breathe next thing you know I'm out on Cumberland Avenue I'm drinking and Cumberland Avenue and the strip it's it's the it's the bars it's the party area in uh, on uh, UT's campus University of Tennessee campus so within an hour and a half I was in a blackout and passed out in one of the bars and the bathrooms. I, I, once I started drinking, it was just boom, boom, boom. I, and, I, and I thought everybody drank that way. And I remember them bring, they brought me back. I ended up back in the dorm room. They went back out and continued on the rest of the evening, but I was, I was passed out. And they brought me back. And a few hours later, I'm waking up throwing up absolutely disgusted with myself and was telling myself, I'm never doing this again. I can see now why people do, you know, whatever. I'm never doing this again. Okay, I got it out of my system. Well, a few hours later, see, it was on a Saturday. I woke up that Saturday morning and Tennessee was getting ready to play Georgia. And all of a sudden my mind was like, okay, I'll handle it better this time. Tennessee's playing Georgia, you know? And it was like that all through that first semester, I had actually become everything I promised myself I'd never become. I lived on promiscuity and booze, could barely get out of bed, barely make it to class. The sh level of shame that I had brought upon myself and the things that I had done to get that first, to get that drink uh, haunts me to this day. I don't, I don't wish to shut the door on that past. And thank God our dark past becomes our greatest asset. It has proven to be just that. But what I'm, what I'm saying is alcoholism, this twofold illness took me to depths of, that I never ever thought I could ever reach. I had no intention of becoming an alcoholic. I had no intention of flunking out of school, of the, you know, I did good on my ACTs. I had a bright future ahead of me, but alcohol took that from me. And I couldn't help but choose to drink every time I was powerless over the choice. I'd lost the power of choice in drink. It consumed me. I'm the one selling plasma <laughs> to get money just so that I could drink. And I thought everybody lived that way in college. 
end of that first semester, I met the man who uh, would eventually be my husband. All through high school, I had dated a guy uh, all four years. We were in church every time the doors were open. I never, I didn't drink anymore after my, you know, that first drunk I told you about. And when he started confronting me on my drinking, I broke up with him. I told myself he's too judgmental. I ended up meeting a guy New Year's Eve of 1997. And um, I was at the lowest of low. He was at his lowest of lows. And uh, a few months later, we started dating and he was all I cared about him and drinking. And I loved being with him because he didn't judge me for the way that I drank. In fact, he drank more than I did. And uh, it made me, I didn't feel so bad about myself. Anyway, I ended up flunking out of uh, UT and moving back home with my mom. My mom was a good, real, real good real estate agent in Rome County uh, and uh, moved, moved back in with her, started working again, and then started back at Rome State Community College. They let me back in after I convinced them that I was just sowing some wild oats at UT. Didn't know I was in the midst of untreated alcoholism, didn't know what alcoholism was. I thought I was just a bad kid that needed to get her ducks in a row and get back in church and, and get her lost. But I, I just, I was so selfish and so self-centered. I couldn't even imagine, but it was constantly, I was constantly running around with what felt like my hair was on fire. And I, I didn't know how not to think of me all the time. I didn't know how not to be selfish. I didn't, know how not to lie. I was just trying to survive um, the guilt and the shame and just get from one day to the next. I didn't know there was a God, the greater, you know, despite the fact that I'd grown up in church, I thought that that, I mean, it was like I, I believed in the idea of, of God or whatever, and it worked and going to church and having that reputation of being a church girl worked for a while, but did I have an actual relationship and a conscious contact with, with, with that God that I professed to believe in? No, I had no power. I was absolutely powerless. Um, anyway, it was the fall, October of, uh, 1998. One morning I'm getting myself together and I'm going, getting ready for class and I start to rush into the bathroom and I'm getting ready. My mom comes in, she's a, getting ready for work and she asked me how her outfit looked and you know, whatever. And I just told her, you're fine, mom, you're beautiful. I blew her off completely because I was in a hurry because I was trying to get out. And what happened was I got to the front door and I was on my way out the storm door and literally I felt something inside me stop and say, tell your mother you love her. Because she had yelled at me and she said, Shanna, I love you, be careful. She knew I was leaving. And I didn't, I didn't listen to that that was in me. What I said was, whatever. And I left, I went to class. Two hours later, I'm being taken to the dean of students office by some officials at, the, at, at Roan State. Police come to get me. I have no idea why. I've never ridden in a police car before. Get to the police station in downtown Kingston and everyone and their little brother that I knew was there. My brother comes around the corner, takes me into office, tells me my mother's dead. Her husband, ex-husband had walked into her real estate office and shot her three times and killed her in cold blood. And it was after that that I moved in with my grandmother. I did the best I could working for my brother. I um, made it through community college, through God's grace. The, the guy that I met, my, in, uh, that I was telling you about, that drank more than me, that he and I were still in relationship. He's in the military. He had left three days prior to mom being killed. He was gone, you know. And the only thing, honestly, that got me through that time was the fact that I poured myself into school. I was drinking all the time. That got me through. I had that to look forward to on the weekends. And I, I worked. I went to school. And I drank. And that's all I did. I wanted to make sure I had enough money for cigarettes and enough money for booze. And that's what I did. Anyway, he comes back from this military training thing that he was doing, and we get together, we make plans, we end up getting married. In 1999, we got married, and I know I started working. He ended up getting, he was in the military, like I said, he got a pilot training slot, 
And but before we went to pilot training, he was he and I were running and gunning. We were doing the gambling. We were doing the drinking. Everything centered around my drinking and his drinking. And I was not a faithful wife. I was not a good wife. I was not a good person. All I cared about was myself. I would go out and I would wait tables you know, while I was in school and stuff, he was working and I would spend all the money and I would go out and stay out all hours and not spend all the money that I made on alcohol. And then we went to, you know, and I thought that my biggest problem was because of all the bad people we were hanging around here in Knoxville. There were times where the drinking and driving that I would do and just over and over. I mean, I could tell you on and on so many stories about all my drunk driving. I mean, it's particularly one time I had, um, Oh my God. I'd made a promise to myself that I wasn't going to drink on New Year's Eve. And I even filled my belly up with Taco Bell to make sure that I was too full to, you know, kind of like Jim and, and, you know, the whiskey and the milk and the, you know, wouldn't hurt him on a full stomach. Anyway, what I did was I ate all this Taco Bell, drove up to a chalet on New Year's Eve, told myself I wasn't going to drink. And then once I get there, oh my gosh, there's pineapple soaked in Everclear. I completely forgot that I told myself that I wasn't going to drink that night. I started, so that's my mental obsession. That's that strange mental blank spot. That's one example of an incident that where this kicked in, as is alcoholism in full force, right? I started eating uh, the pineapple, soaked in Everclear, even on a full stomach. The next thing you know, I'm eating the whole bowl. The next thing you know, I'm drinking. And the next thing you know, I'm doing extracurriculars. And the next thing you know, I'm driving my husband and his best friend back in a blackout from the top of a mountain in Gatlinburg at two or three o'clock in the morning, no guardrails in a blackout. And somehow, but through God's grace, I know now, made it back to Knoxville, to our house in Knoxville. Absolutely incredible. And see what I've learned since being in Alcoholics Anonymous is stuff like that. Okay. The mental obsession, the strange mental blank spot, that's one part of step one, I'm unable to manage the decision to not pick up that first drink. And the physical allergies, I'm powerless over alcohol. Once I start, after I put it in my body, I can't stop. My step two experience, you know, things like that where I should have been dead so many times. I told my husband how nervous I was about, and by the way, I'm still married. I'm married to the same guy. Um, we, by, you know, it's an absolute miracle we celebrate 23 years married. Um, on the 18th of this month. And um, he told me, he said, Shanna, I, I know you're nervous, but the reason why you're so nervous tonight is because you're still alive. And he said, you're alive. You feel it because you're alive. So feel it. He goes, I support what you're doing. He's a good man. so grateful so grateful for all he's done for me and he's been there for me since I got sober he's not sober he, he may or may not be one of us I don't know but it's funny how when I first got into AA what's interesting is for years I thought he was the problem I thought he if he just quits drinking then I will be okay because he drank more than me and I was able to go periods of time without drinking and moving on to 2008 when I was at home with the kids a lot. Um, he was out of town. He's a pilot in the military. He's flying C-17s out of Charleston. We were living in Charleston, South Carolina at the time. By then I was 29 years old and I knew that I needed somehow to get my life back in order. And I didn't know any other way. I didn't know what I was suffering from. I didn't know what alcoholism was, but if anybody in my family was an alcoholic, it, it was my dad, you know, and I knew I didn't want to end up like him. He ended up dying in, um, uh, as a criminal um, and as, uh, for, as a result of a lot of uh, heavy drinking and, and drug use and stuff, like, stuff that, of that nature. And he had a temper on him and see me without a drink. I have a pressure cooker on the inside of me and I have no control over my emotional nature and see me without a drink going periods of time without drinking. I just, I go crazy. I didn't know I was suffering from untreated alcoholism and miserable dry drunk. 
So around uh, the summer of 2008, I had by then tried church uh, again. I had attended church. I'd started praying again. I had all these answers to prayer. I was having all these spiritual experiences that people in the church couldn't even explain. Um, I was trying to stay sober for the kids. My husband was out of town all the time. And when he did come home, he was drinking. I thought I was just crazy. And one night in my son's bedroom, this little boy, he was probably, he's my oldest son. He's 19 now. And he's uh, five, or, he was five or six years old at the time. And he did what a typical little boy does uh, th that age. He disobeyed. He was holding a little electric guitar, play his favorite toy in his hand. I snatched it out of his hand. I busted into a million pieces across my knee. He screamed in terror and cried and said, mommy, why are you so mean? And in that moment, I fell down on my knees and I begged God for help. I said, God, I don't know what's wrong with me, but who does this? I want to die every day and I have everything to live for. You got to help me. I don't know what I'm capable of. I'm scared of harming my child. And I could see and feel my dad. My dad used to abuse me when I was little. Um, and he terrified me and I could feel that coming out in me toward my own kids and something I swore I'd never become. But I, something inside of me knew that I absolutely could not control myself. And it was getting worse. Even though I wasn't drinking, you know. Anyway, um, a few days later, I visited a church. And this is just my story. I visited this church that um, was suggested to me. It was a church that actually held a Mother's Morning Out program that I was planning on sending my kids to, but I got invited to, to one of the services. And I remember sitting in the back, my son begging me, Mommy, please, let's move up front. Let's sit up front. I want to sit up front. And I'm like, I don't want to sit up front. I don't want to be seen. I was so ashamed of myself. I didn't know. I, I knew I didn't belong there. I knew I wasn't good enough for God or anybody else. I just wanted to hide. But he kept on. And I finally just looked up at, this, at the ceiling at, and said to God, God, put me where you want me. I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know. But I'm going to put my hand in this little boy's hand. And I'm going to trust that wherever I end up is where I belong. So I did. And then we end up. I end up sitting up front at the end of the service. The kind of people that were sitting around me, little did I know, were mem recovered members of Alcoholics Anonymous. One of the women on that bench ended up being my first sponsor. And the reason why I found this out is because they reached their hands out to me and they offered me friendship and fellowship. And in that, at that time, I was able to open up and tell them what was going on with me. And that woman... I see I started out in, in a sister fellowship in Al-Anon because I thought my husband was the problem and the best thing she ever did for me was hand me this big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and she says to me here learn about your husband's disease I said all right and I did I read I was like, I'm gonna fix him and I started reading this thing and I started reading that doctor's opinion and talked about you know um in, in page 44 if when you honestly want to you find you cannot quit entirely or if when drinking you have little control over the amount you take you know thing I think I thought like these people I felt like these people I drank like these people and I'm like no way I'm 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 not an alcoholic I've never had a DUI I've never gone to jail I don't have people beating down my door telling me I need to quit drinking the people around me drink like I do I'm not that bad but I couldn't deny the stuff in this book and so I went to that Al-Anon sponsor who was also in Alcoholics Anonymous. Little did I know at the time, I didn't know she handed me actually Al-Anon non-conference non approved literature by handing me that big book, but she did it anyway, you know, whatever. And I said to her, I said, how did you know you were an alcoholic? And she said, I couldn't stop at that buzz tipsy feeling. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. She said, you could try some controlled drinking. And I did. I tried it. I tried it more than once. And on October 13th of 2008, picked up my final white chip, which just so happened to be the 10-year anniversary of my mother's death. See, from 98 to 2008, every year, October 13th was a, a day of dread and doom and gloom. And from that point forward, it's become a day a celebration, a new beginning. I got a new birthday that day. And what's interesting is I just, I celebrate 
belly button birthday with my mom, January 22nd was we shared the same birthday, physical birthday. I was born on her 30th birthday. And so anyway, I got into the steps, worked the steps. I uh, got into, um, I gave my will and life over to the care of God as a result of coming to believe that I was powerless over alcohol. I was willing to believe this program could work for me too. I was willing to go through the rest of those steps. I wrote, wrote out that four-step inventory. Of course, one of my biggest resentments was the resentment I had toward my uh, stepdad who killed my mom. And of course, my mom, and I had plenty of other resentments too as well, but that was the biggest one. I was instructed to pray for this person. I started praying for this person. Next thing you know, I start thinking as a result of taking that inventory, I got to see that he, like me, was sick too, perhaps. You know, and, and asking God to show him the same tolerance, pity, and patience, I would cheerfully grant a sick friend. I started praying this stuff. Compassion started happening. And then all of a sudden thoughts like how many people could you have killed with all the drunk driving that you did, Shanna? How often could you have killed your, your own husband, your own friends? And, you know, I didn't plan to be an alcoholic. And you know what? Guess what happened with him? He had quit drinking for a long time. He was a miserable dry drunk for a long time. He started drinking again and he killed my mom. I have I happened to believe that when he was a little boy, he didn't, he didn't set out to, to become a murdering criminal. But I believe Alcoholics Anonymous converts us into, into people we never hoped to become and that's I believe that's what happened to him and so I started praying for this guy and then my I talked it over with my sponsor and it, I needed to make amends for the selfishness self-centeredness dishonesty resentment and fear that I had toward him I had to, regardless of the fact that he did cause me more harm than I caused him I had to take the bit in my own teeth or I wasn't going to be free of this resentment so that's exactly what I did my instructions were to write the letter because obviously I couldn't see him and we went over it, I did my homework, I owned my part, but my letter to him was, Larry, I'm sorry you're in pain, I forgive you, because you know what, the reason why I said, I'm sorry you're in pain is if I was in his shoes, I couldn't imagine living with myself for the rest of my life knowing I'd taken a life with another person. And that I would have to sit in jail for the rest of my life knowing and not knowing and probably not having the opportunity to say I'm sorry and that I regret what I did. Alcoholics Anonymous has given me this opportunity and it's turned everything I thought about this whole situation on its head. And that's what God does. So what I did, I sent this letter a couple of weeks later, I get a letter back from him. And the letter says, Dear Shan, I received your note a few days ago and I was really surprised to hear from you, but I was also very happy that you had written. I do know that without God in your heart, no one could do what you did. And I'm so thankful that you forgave me. I'm so sorry for what happened in the past and thank you for your note and for your forgiveness. I hope you like the card that I sent you. He sent me this card. This was back in 2010. It was, he said the card, I hope you like the card. The text was taken from one of the daily devotions dated the day I received your note. Take care, may God bless and keep you is my prayer. The devotion, it had a, it had, it had a scripture in it, but it said one of the keys to overcoming disappointments in life is learning to let go of the past. You let go of the past by choosing to forgive those who have hurt or wronged you by believing that God will restore you, that God will restore to you anything that was taken. His devotional that day was all about forgiveness. So what I learned from that was that God had already forgiven him before my letter even arrived. And that day that he did that devotional, he was able to honestly share that with me. And he used a murdering criminal to show me that the consciousness of my own belief had come to me, that these steps were for real, that God was for real and God was healing us. And who was I to hold this grudge? I have no more hate toward this man. I have no more hate toward my mom. And because of that, I've been able to forgive so many people and myself 
And not because I'm better or wor- or they're so bad. It's just simply because I'm able now, because of this way of life and through God's grace, that I'm able to look at people around me as human. I'm looking at, at myself as human. That all of us are just trying to do the best we can. And when those resentful thoughts crop up and when, the, when I get mad, when I'm not getting my way, when I'm being dishonest in my thinking, right? Not necessarily, I'm not going around lying to people like with my mouth, you know, but the dishonesty, I believe it happens because I cannot see the whole picture. You know, when I'm in self, when I'm ticked that I'm not getting my way or fear, afraid or whatever, I'm not seeing the whole picture. And that's the kind of dishonesty. And it, what, that, that, what that means is I got to pause, right? And I got to be willing to look at, okay, maybe things aren't what they seem because it's such a disease of perception, you know, and in doing step five, I was able to see my part in things and see things from an entirely different angle. And what I saw, especially in step, step six and seven, was that the alcohol and the way I was living and drinking and all of that, that was just a symptom of what was going on inside of me. And I needed to be changed. Like I needed a power greater than myself who had the power to literally remove defects of character. And so the God of my understanding that I choose as my God of my understanding has that power. And in steps, step seven, I'm able to ask now, you know, God, whatever's standing in the way of my usefulness to you, please, you know, remove this. And it's not usually ever in my timing or in the way I'd like for it to be, but it always happens right on time. You know, in step eight and step nine, you know, I was able to make that list. Of course, he was on. And there's other amends that I was able to make uh, as well. My gosh. Step eight and nine has been the absolute meat and potatoes for me. And I've seen and experienced the reality of God more in steps eight and nine, I believe, than in any other step. Those promises started coming true. I remember one, this is before I got to eight and nine. I remember being, I was living in Charleston at the time. I was just absolutely distraught about something. I don't even remember what it was about, but I remember getting on my knees in my kitchen and begging God for, God, when are these promises going to come true? When are, you know, I'm doing the work. I'm going to the meetings. I'm working the steps. I'm praying. I'm showing up for my commitments. I'm sponsoring people, you know, whatever, trying to carry them out. I'm doing you know, and I'm on my knees praying this. And all of a sudden I hear this thud and feel this bump on my head. And I look and a little book had fallen on my head. My little boy, while I was praying, the same boy that took my hand and led me to Alcoholics Anonymous, the same little boy that I prayed for that night that I busted his little guitar and broke his heart was the same little boy that took this little book off of a shelf while I'm praying, drops it on my head and I look at it. And the title of that book is said it was a book that I had bought long ago hadn't looked at it in forever but it said the promise of God's power and there it was right after I had prayed that and it was, it was not it was I was in the, working in the middle of step eight and nine right so that's just one of them and there was other amends that you know there was a letter that I got to write to my grandfather and I was instructed you know to write out my amends letter to my grandfather go to a quiet place and read it, you know, to him and to my, uh, to, to God, and then make sure that I took the opportunity to burn the letter as a symbol of it going into the spiritual realm. Well, I'm a young mom, and I'm, I go, and I do this, I go to the church that, you know, the, the upper room of this church, do what I'm supposed to do, pray what I'm supposed to pray, read the letter, grab the kids from daycare, come back home, throw all my notebooks and all. And the letter was inside the spiral bound notebook. I threw it across the stove, went to change some diapers. The next thing you know, my little boy who dropped the book on my head, who I broke his guitar, who led me to AA says, mom, there's smoke. I run downstairs. What's interesting is I had prayed as I left that church, God, please remind me to burn that letter because that is what I will forget to do. I know it. I get downstairs and sitting on top of the glass top, my glass top stove was that notebook. Somehow the eye got turned on and it was burning up through the bottom of that notebook and it stopped right there at that letter that I had just read to my grandfather. And then I remembered, I need to burn this letter. And I did. That's just one, another one. 
you know, there was another amends that I had, I got to make. Uh, one of my college friends, I used her, abused her. Long story short, I hadn't seen her. Uh, you know, it was, I want to say it was in 2011. I hadn't seen her. I didn't know if she was dead or alive. Mary didn't know how to contact her, but I remember walking into a gym that she and I went to when we were in college together. And it reminded me of her. And I looked up at the sky and I said a prayer. I said, God, I don't know where Janet is. That was her name. But I'd love the opportunity to set things right with her. It was a financial amend. Two days later, I walked back into that same gym. There she is in front of me on an elliptical machine. I couldn't believe it. And I'd just taken money out. I was able to put, give her money. And, I, and a friendship formed from that. I made the amends right there in that gym. Another one, my clinical instructor, you know, in, in OT school, I was a bad student. Absolute alcoholism. I got kicked out. Hated her, resented her. She was on my list. She came to mind one Saturday morning. It was right around Christmas time. I prayed. She kept coming to mind. And literally, I heard in my heart some, something say to me, you will never advance in your career unless you make amends to your clinical instructor. I knew exactly who it was. Her name was Dina. I went about the rest of that day praying, doing whatever it was I needed to do. I went to a meeting, went to Coles and Farragut, which is an area of Knoxville. That evening, I'm shopping around and I'm asking God to help me keep my mind off myself and help me, you know, help, you know, not be selfish and actually buy for the people I'm supposed to buy for instead of myself. I look up and there that woman is, Dina, right there in Coles. And what's crazy is, you know, I would love to say that I didn't shrink, but I was terrified. I couldn't believe it. This woman I th hadn't seen in years was right in front of me in this department store. I hid behind a clothes rack when she walked past me because I got so scared. And I begged God, I was like, God, please help me. I called my sponsor real quick. And I'm like, my God, I messed up, messed up the opportunity to make amends to this woman. God, please help. Please help me not do this. Please help me to do what I need to do. If I'm supposed to make amends to this girl right here, let me do it. And all of a sudden I start making my way up to the front. She's in the checkout line. I'm like, she's getting ready to leave. And all of a sudden the register jams. She's stuck at the, it gives me time to get up front. I stop there and it gives me time to calm down and wait on her. I'm able to make amends to her right there in the front of Coles. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. The consciousness of my belief was coming to me. You know, when stuff like that happens, those non-step promises, fear, I mean, there's, it's unreal to know that God really is real and he cares about this stuff and he wants to make me to make things right. The stuff I'm most ashamed of, he helps me make right when I'm willing to go to any length. Unbelievable. And finally, my most favorite precious amends, same little boy that I busted his little guitar. I'm living in Sarasota, Florida at the time. This was back in 20, 2019, April of 2019. My son's birthday is uh, April 4th. And a couple of weeks prior to that, that incident about the guitar busting, me breaking his guitar, he was only little, he didn't even remember the incident, keeps coming to my mind. And I feel so bad about it. And I, by then, you know, I'm living in 10, 11, and 12, and I had been for years, continuing to take personal inventory, continuing in prayer and meditation, you know, continuing in, in trying to carry the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. I have the home group commitment. I have the sponsor who knows I, she's my sponsor. I'm sponsoring people. You know, I'm, I'm doing whatever I need to do. But this keeps coming to my mind. And I go to my sponsor and I said, hey, you know, um, this keeps happening. And she said, just pray about it. Keep praying about it. Ask God what he wants you to do with this one. Okay, so I do. I follow those directions. And about three days prior to my son's birthday, I go to my, my son and he's, it's a six, he's getting ready to turn 16. And I say to him, honey, how, what would you like for your birthday? And I had mentioned a thing about this guitar. He said, I'd like a brand new electric guitar. You could have knocked me over with a feather. <laughs> I was so elated. See, he's never seen me drunk. The same boy. He didn't remember me busting his guitar. He didn't remember anything about it. But see, God knew. My sponsor knew. I knew. Y'all know. This is kind of cool stuff that happens. It's, you know, it's not just about getting my stuff back. It's not just about having a the material it's 
it's that conscious contact with the God of my, my creator that loves me more than I could possibly a man cares about this stuff that that matters knowing that without his help I'm unable to form a true partnership with another human being I'm unable to connect with other humans but he makes that connection possible because of the level of desperation I couldn't I can't even imagine being grateful to be so desperate as a result of alcoholism but it's brought me to my knees when I saw how powerless when I see how powerless I am that's when I'm able to step into the power of God. Humility opens the door for God's power. I can't create humility. I'm not unselfish enough to humble myself enough. That's why I'm so grateful for the defects that he's still left in me because without, without the defects, I wouldn't need God. I wouldn't care enough. And uh, I got to go and I got to make that make that amend I got to go and shop for that that guitar and I could spend another hour just going over the details of how God led me through the purchase of that guitar and it ended up being the most perfect gift ever and he still has I have a picture of him and you know what's cool too is he is in a band and he's created an album he and his friends I mean he's he's got a music career possibly ahead of him I mean it's unbelievable and he's a good kid He's never had to see his mama drunk. The same little boy. He saved my life. And I hope, I hope. And one of the things my sponsor at that time told me, he said, your number one job is to be a sober mama. And I've gotten to be a sober mama to two wonderful kids. I've gotten to meet so many wonderful people. And the women in my life are amazing. The people in my life are amazing. My home group is the Tennessee group in Knoxville. Um, we meet on Thursdays at seven. I have a service position. I'm a greeter there. I get the opportunity on Fridays to carry the message to the Anderson County Jail in Clinton. I do that every week and, and I get to do that and I get to share this stuff with them. Unbelievable. I got the opportunity to take uh, already one girl through all the, all the 12 steps. She doesn't get out of jail until um, April, but she's able to help the other girls in jail. And I get to go and I get to see this happening. Um, I get to sponsor some amazing women. You know, um, it's unbelievable the stuff that, that, that they do and that they, they bring to me and that I see a reflection of myself in them. And I get to share, you know what? I've been there and I've done that. I have a girl from, from, from Kingston just so happened. I started sponsoring not too long ago that, from my own hometown, I mean, it's just uncanny what God does. Um, today, I get to continue to do that inventory. I do a nightly review every night. Uh, I read pages 84 through 88 out of the big book. Um, my sponsor used the big book to, and, and the directions out of the big book to take me through all 12 steps. You know, I continue in prayer. I do, you know, I take the action on pages 84 through 88. You know, pop pause, you know, it's not perfect at all by any stretch, but it works every time I try it. Every time I take the action, it works. Pause when agitated or doubtful. Ask God for the right thought or action. If I'm twisted up, resentful, selfish, dishonest, afraid, whatever, when that stuff crops up, when, not if, but when, I'm able to go to God with that. And then I'm able to talk that out with my sponsor, make amends. And my amends are nowhere near as dramatic as they used to be. Thank God they don't have to be. And um, I get to turn my thoughts to those I can help. I go to a meeting. I try to help another alcoholic. I call, you know, a sponsee back. Or, or, or what's really cool is when after I just get off a 10 step with my sponsor and, and look for help, a sponsee will call me and be like, hey, I got this going on. I'm like, I just went through that. I literally just got off the phone with my sponsor talking exactly about what you're talking about. I mean, we have entered the world of the spirit, you know, and thank God we're not cured of this, right? Thank God it's a never ending thing. I'm, I am not cured of alcoholism. You know, we grow, you know, in understanding and effectiveness. Um, 
anyway, I feel like I might ought to uh, slow it down and, and turn it off here. <laughs> and I appreciate the opportunity. I couldn't be more grateful for this program. Like I said, I would never have imagined AA being the most important thing in my life, but I'm absolutely beyond grateful that God stepped in and heard my cry that night and led me to Alcoholics Anonymous when I did not even know what was wrong with me. He did. And y'all do. And I have everything I need. With that, I'll pass and I love you guys and thanks for having me.